So just reflecting, it's like remembering, observing the here and now. It's this, this way of uh, reminding oneself. <clears throat> Attention here and now, as simple as that. It's paying attention. <clears throat> but observing, not paying attention from a personal position. A personal and the impersonal. Uh, and this is, this is why it's, I encourage you to really you know, use these uh, first three fetters as a reference point. So you begin to, they're very helpful if you, you know, if you use them properly for observing yourself. Observing the, whatever, you know, the emotional emotions you're experiencing or opinions, views, feelings, uh, whatever, the physical body. The assumptions, the attitudes, the ideals that we have, all the identities, uh, you know, so that, that this kind of artificial self is summed up very clearly in the first three fetters, which are Sake Ditti Silabhata Brahmasa Vichikita. Pali words. Sakya Ditti, of course, is the, we translated generally in English as personality view. But it's the created sense of a self, a separate, it's a separate sense of self. You, you know, what we identify with the body or the uh, memories one has, uh, one's uh, cultural background, one's position, one's gender, one's um, emotional tendencies. Now all these things like, they, these things are what they are, but, but Sakya Ditti is this kind of blind assumption that I am these very conditions. You know, I am this body, this is mine, and then I operate Always, if I operate from Sakya Ditti, what is the result, you know, in terms of here and now? When I'm full of myself, my own views, my feelings, my emotions, and so like mindfulness is being aware of that, when, I, when I'm caught up in my own fears or anxieties or desires, opinions, views, ideals, assumptions. What is it like? You know, so then this uh, here and now, Pachubhanatama approach, observing this sense of me and my feelings and what I think is like this. So what I'm doing is putting uh, this, uh, this, this tendency to see myself in terms of identities, blind kind of assumptions, unquestioned uh, assumptions that I am this, this physical body. Of course, the society we live in affirms that, you know, we are your, your Ajahn Sumato, your this, that. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's on the conventional level, fair enough. But now we're going beyond convention, not just uh, operating from conventional assumptions and attitudes and cultural conditioning, to observing, being the puto, being the observer of conditions as we're experiencing them, because because uh, the suffering of the First Noble Truth is all about this, uh, this mistaken identity. 
the dukkha, you know, there is suffering, is because of this delusion that we live in. And so, you know, you, this, is, this is to be investigated. We're not trying to, to deny self or it's not, say, see it as something we've got to get rid of, but to recognize and to recognize the suffering that comes from being blindly, ignorantly attached to the sense of my self as a person, a physical being, a, a male, uh, abbot, upachaya. It's all suffering. If, if I'm just blindly attached to any of these identities, there's something always coming kind of unsettling about being somebody. And this is to, to get behind that, to observe this sense, because it is a sense of separateness and isolation. Because, you know, just the reality of having a body, a physical body, you know, is, it's, got, it's a very observable that my body is separate from yours. I'm sitting up here on this seat, you're down there on the mat. And so that's the conventional reality, you know, of the way it is. And if I'm identified with my physical body, my position, say I'm, I'm a teacher. If I'm identified, I'm, I'm here, I'm the teacher teaching you Dhamma. Or I'm the head monk or whatever, of the, this monastery. These, are, these can be conventions, but as, you know, if we don't see through convention, then we, we tend to operate from positions. You know, even our life, even when, we're, you know, if you never investigate this, even when you're alone in your kuti, you can still see yourself as a teacher and somebody like this. You know, we just get fixed in, the, in these conventional identities, never getting beyond them, but always limited by them. Ajahn Chah was always emphasizing the difference between Baramata Satcha and Samuti Satcha. So like Satcha, of course, Pali word for truth, Paramatta Satcha is ultimate truth, ultimate reality. Samut, samuti Satcha is conventional reality. So <clears throat> you notice we're not just, uh, you know, uh, raising Paramatta Satcha as another kind of personal attainment. So, you know, none of us are, as personalities are ever going to attain. Uh, Bharamata Satcha, or ultimate reality, on a personal level. If that, if that delusion is never penetrated, then there's no hope. You just, that you're in the samsaric vortex, whirling around, a whirlpool of, of uh, conditioning. So that's why in this, in this chant that I like so much, the unconditioned, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Now that there is an escape from the born, the created, the form, the conditions, because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So like in my own practice over the years, I'm investing, what is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned here and now? Not a, as some kind of defining it intellectually or trying to think it's something I've got to attain, but recognizing, you know, really seeing the dukkha or the suffering of being stuck into the form that created, the conditioned. Because that's, that's where, you know, that's where I 
as a person experience suffering is when I'm lose it, when I'm not being mindful and I get caught up into this sense of me, mine, what I think, my position, what I want, my view. The important sense of myself, identifying with the age of the body, with the appearance, with the position I'm in, with the gender of the body, with the cultural conditioning. With the uh, Theravada Buddhism, you know, I can be attached to to this perception I'm a Theravadan Buddhist. Or I'm from the Thai forest tradition or things like this. This is, you know, these are perceptions, they're conventions, and the attachment to those positions, even they're very good ones, like I I think the Thai forest tradition is a very good perception. <laughs> but attachment to it is one thing. Out of ignorance, out of avicca. <clears throat> How many of you conceive yourselves as unenlightened persons? Right now, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Just to investigate, how many of you really see yourself, you know, as someone who's unenlightened, has to practice in order to become? How many of you see yourself at this time with all kinds of faults, weaknesses, uh, things you don't, you know, you, you feel ashamed of, that you, you want to get rid of. And how many of you want to aspire to become something? Want to become enlightened, want to become a teacher, want to become, uh, a, you know, an en enlightened person. And so this is, uh, you know, I'm pointing directly at Sakyaditi, the sense of, you know, even when you conceive yourself, you know, this is humbling anyway. It's not, you know, I'm no, I'm not enlightened person. I'm just an ordinary person trying to become enlightened. And I still have all kinds of faults. I can see weaknesses in my character and, and tendencies, you know, that are unwholesome or obstructions, or I have various emotional habits that I find threatening. It's more dangerous to think of it, I'm, I'm perfectly enlightened and, and I don't need to practice. That's <laughs> Those kind of people, they're hopeless. You can't <laughs> fight it. <laughs> but, uh, at least, you know, the sense of I'm, uh, I'm a hopeless case or I can't practice very well or I'm unenlightened. You know, it's, it's uh, this, at least, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're not uh, boasting, you're assuming that, that you are somebody who's unenlightened. But actually assuming you're somebody that's enlightened is, is very much the same thing. It's the exact opposite of the other. And that which is aware, I have to start thinking, you know, I am unenlightened, and I start thinking, and, and I'm operating. If I operate from that position, you know, then I'm unenlightened person that's trying to become enlightened, that's a, that's a creation with words, isn't it? This sense of I, that's an English pronoun. You know, it's a, it's a human created perception. I 
am somebody, I'm a person who is unenlightened. And, you know, just intentionally thinking it and listening, that which is aware of that sequence of words. What's that? You know, this is where we discern, where the discerning ability is necessary. That which listens and that which acts, like the, the active side, I'm an unenlightened person. And that which is observing it, and this is, this is a subtle shift from operating from the words, the assumption, is not denying it, we're not saying, you know, not saying there's anything wrong with that assumption, but it is a creation that, that we can blindly operate from, never questioning it. But operating, maybe our whole monastic life, we operate from that basic assumption and never see through it, never see what it is. <clears throat> so with mindfulness, you're actually aware of it. Mindfulness isn't saying, judging it, saying it's wrong or right or true or false. But this is what we mean by discerning, what, what intuitive awareness, what sati sampachanya is. Awareness of your own thinking is like this. Now this is... Uh, very direct kind of thing to be doing. But I challenge you to, you know, to really observe, listen to yourself, not judge yourself. You know, even when you're in a bad mood or something, you know, it's, you know, whatever, you know, angry, upset, or vain, or hurt, or offended, whatever emotions you're experiencing, it's all practice for us. Observing is like this. Feeling offended is like this. Not getting what I want is like this. Feeling disappointed, disillusioned is like this. And so everything is you know, is, uh, is, uh, can be the path knowledge. If we really recognize the power that is behind this awareness of the object. So I'm an unenlightened person is an object, isn't it? I have to, you know, intentionally think it. Or maybe I just operate, maybe I've never, some of you probably never question that. You just operate from that premise. That's why we all become monks and nuns, isn't it? Because we all think we're unenlightened and we'd like to become enlightened. We all can see ourselves as, you know, how many of you identify strongly with your faults and weaknesses? Well, you think being true and, uh, you know, and being uh, straight and true and not being a phony is is by, you know, recounting all your, your faults and weaknesses, your flaws. So like the ego is uh, the sakyaditi. This is an illusion that our society operates from. You know, it's part of the way the society is anyway. So it's, it's not, you know, I'm not saying it's blaming you personally, but just pointing to it. We come from a society that is, operates from this delusion. Now, the Sakya Ditti is the first fetcher. It's very 
you know, it takes a while to really, you know, you've got to really pursue it, listen to it. You know, don't try to be a saint or, or, or just think you're being honest about yourself because you, you can describe all your weaknesses and faults or analyze yourself endlessly why you have these fears or irrational moods and things like that because of past experience or abuse in the past or, you know, we, we just create this sense of, of a self. It becomes more and more complicated. So it's, you know, we go on endlessly about trying to, why do I have these uh, kind of, this uh, kind of anxiety about life because of past experience, uh, because of my mother, father, whatever. <laughs> this, this just reinforces this basic uh, delusion of a self. Even though it can be, you know, it's kind of interesting to, Figure, try to figure yourself out why you are like you are. But at the end of the day, you're still stuck with it. I mean, if you come up with some very, you know, good uh, analyses of, of why you have these fears or anger or obsessions, but you're still, it's still a self-operating whether you're, you know, you feel better about yourself or worse. So it's like this, this uh, observing Sakya Diti is not criticizing it, not making anything more of it, but recognizing it. So in, in my own practice, like this, this sense of I am, just, this, just these two words, a pronoun and a verb, thinking it, because it's a thought, isn't it? I have to think I am. I know, you know, when there's no I am, in, when I'm not thinking it. But if I operate always from this position of I am, unquestioningly, then it does. It's always this separative sense of uh, I'm separate from you, I'm this person, you're that person. And then, then, of course, I am is still just a, you know, actually, in reality, it's just a statement of presence, of being, isn't it? Because we are all operating from the particular uh, forms that we have, you know. I'm sitting up here, which is a fact, isn't it? I'm sitting on the high seat, you're sitting on the floor. <laughs> and so that's the conventional reality. But in terms of Bharamatta Satya, we're seeing that is conventional reality as it's an artificial creation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's creating something out of ignorance and identity. Or it can be just... Uh, uh, a way of communication on the on the conventional level. Not that conventions are can be used skillfully with wisdom or stupidly or blindly. So it's very important to discern the difference between a convention, what a convention is, and uh, ultimate reality. Discerning the difference. You know, it, most people don't discern the difference. They just operate on the conventional level. Unquestionably, you know, conventional, the conventional level is uh, the real world to most people. <clears throat> So 
So I want, you know, the Buddha is pointing at the escape, the way out of the conventional, just blind uh, attachment and habitual, uh, you know, involvement with a conventional reality. It's not a, an annihilation of it, it's not a judgment, but it's, it's pointing to, you know, if we just operate on that level, what is the result? That's why we're here, isn't it? Because most of us have been operating from the conventional level and we feel something's wrong, something, something's missing. Why would we come to a Buddhist monastery anyway? Because uh, the conventional, we live in a pretty decent conventional society. You know, Britain, it's a very nice country. On a conventional level, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, we all have our views and opinions and criticisms of it, but basically, you know, on planet Earth, it's good enough. It's a democratic system and it's, you know, fairly stable government and democracy and all that. So, I mean, it's still unsatisfying, isn't it? These, you know, most of us are here, not because we want to, we're so involved with the conventional realities. But even when the conventional realities are fairly good, it's still something, you know, there's still dukkha, because we're, we're still operating from ignorance, from avicca. Then uh, Sila Bhattabharama, so this is quite a mouthful for at first when you first hear it. It sounds like <laughs> funny, funny language. You say, Sakya Ditti Sila Bhattabharama Samuchikicha. And I know what that must sound like if you, <laughs> if this is the first time you've heard it. But I mean, there's ten fetters. The first three fetters are the obstructions to stream entry, Sotapanna. Now these, these are, you know, there's these four stages, Sotapanna, Sakata, Kami, Anakami, Arahant. There are ten fetters. Now this is a convention to, to use, not to, not to claim or, you know, you're saying you're a stream enterer, it's Sakya Ditti again. You know, I'm, I'm an arahant, or I'm not an arahant. Is sakya ditti. They're not. They're not concepts to attain or become as a person, at all. So you know, you go to, you see people going to Thailand, and I mean, years ago, I remember, and and I before I came to England, you know, you get these people wandering through Thailand looking for arahants. You know, Western Westerners, you know, trying to figure out who's an arahant and wanting to attain, become a stream enterer. And and then there's, there's you know the basic delusion. You you know, Sakya Ditti will will grasp these perceptions of sotapa. I am a sotapanna, or I'm not a sotapanna. Same thing, whether it's Sakada Kami, Anakami, or Arahant, or Messiah, or Maitreya. Say, I'm not Maitreya, or I am Maitreya. <laughs> I'm the Messiah, or I'm not the Messiah. And so this is, this is you know, getting into seemingly absurdity. But it is why, the way the world thinks, isn't it? You know, on a personal level, I've never considered myself a messiah or a Maitreya Buddha or anything like that. It's just never been a problem for me. Uh, on a personal level, I've come from a more skeptical, critical mind, aware 
of my weaknesses. Making a big deal, making a big thing about my faults. The fact that I, on a personal level, I don't live up to my ideals. You know, I'm not the person that I would like to be as a person. But if used properly, like what I'm trying to convey in this reflection this morning is, is uh, you know, how to use this form. It's a convention to use, not, you know, not, you know and the, the, of course the big thing is to break through the illusion of Sakya Ditti. So you, you, none of us will ever become Sotapanas as persons. Give up that idea. If you, if you think you can attain sotapanna as, from the personal position, you can't. And if you do feel you're a sotapanna, you're, you're obviously deluding yourself. Stream enterer, that's what sotapanna means. What is stream entry? You know, the, these three fetters are artificial things created by human beings. They're made by human beings, by culture, by cultural conditioning. It's samuti satya, it's conventional. It's cultural conditioning, isn't it? Ethnic identities, religious identities, all of it is, is, uh, is conditioned. So these first three fetters are emphasizing these because these are the big obstruction. If you can break through that delusion, you know, get through and see through these, these artificial, these artifices that we've created. Now I'm not saying because they're artificial they're, they're good or bad. Their qualities can be good and bad, right and wrong, true and false. You know, so the, the, these are all about conditioned phenomena. Sakaya Ditti, the personality view, uh, ego, the sense of myself as a separate person, me as a physical presence, the age of the body, the gender of the body, the position, is conventional reality. Then that which is aware of conventional reality is What's that? In order to discern it, I have to let go of identifying with it. And of course, this is what, what I'm trying to point to, is that trusting in this awareness of what you think you are. You know, to, to discern the difference so that you, you're, you're, you're learning how to trust what the ultimate reality and no longer be so totally convinced and operate from the conventional reality. Now this is a, you know, a seismic shift, a quantum leap, and because you're shifting out of the momentum of habit and conditioning into ultimate reality. And so there is an escape from the born, the created, the form, the condition. That's it. It is mindfulness is the gate to the deathless. So listening, you know, this sense of listening to the ego. And, and, and observing, being the knower. So this relationship of Buddha to Dhamma, you know, this is, these are the refuges again. They use this mantra, Bhutto, Tammo, Sangpo. These are, these are conventions too, they're words. 
but they're, they're not meant to be identities. They're not trying to, to uh, you know, create them and, and, and identify or, or grasp them. They're merely expedient means to remind ourselves because we so easily, when we're living in, in the society we're, uh, that we've been conditioned by, it was so, old, you know, we tend to easily be taken on by it. You know, just so natural, so easy, just to drift into the sense of oneself. And, it, you know, it, it, we're just so used to it. Even if we've got, if we don't like ourselves or we're depressed, it's easier to go along feeling sorry for yourself or depressed or upset than to not, to observe it. So this attentiveness is, you know, this paying attention, sati sampachanya, observing. And then in the Pali form you've got the aramana, is the mental object. The sense of I am enlightened, I am unenlightened. That is, there's an observing of it when I think this thought. I am unenlightened is I can observe, I'm thinking, a thought. The sense of I am somebody who isn't enlightened is like this. It's words. That which is aware of that thinking, that sentence. It has no name. But it's recognizable, and it's discernible. And so, to to really investigate in this way, to you know, I feel sometimes that my sense of despair uh, arises when you know, and you've been teaching this for years, and people still operate mainly from the Sakya Ditti level. There's moments of despair with the Sangha because they had all these years and they're still operating from that. And, uh, and he, you, know, I, you know, when you really contemplate what I, you know, my reflections over the years, I'm saying the same thing all the time. You know, nothing new. But it is... Uh, you know, just a repetition, and yet your personalities can be your reality. Your mood, your emotions are the real world for you. You know, you operate from that, from and 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 then you know this is, and then you create the suffering, like sangha life, monastic life. We can create all kinds of suffering around it. <clears throat> if it's taken personally. If it's personal. And unquestioned, operating from personal uh, identities. Con at these, or these conventional identities become my identity.
But then the despair that I feel is Sakyaditya again, isn't it? Because I, I want you to understand this. <laughs> so when you don't seem to, then I... They saw it, it has to, you always have to go back to, to the here and now as you're experiencing it in the present. You know, and I, can, I really want you to see this, you know. I, I really want you to break out of the realm of dukkha, of suffering. And so, uh, you know, that, and if I attach to that desire, then I suffer too. And uh, Sila Bhattabharamasa is like uh, conventional, it's like cultural conditioning, social. These are kind of acquired attitudes from a uh, culture that you're born into, from your parents, uh, the class identities. These are not maybe so personal, uh, you know, or so, you know, but they're more or less assumed like nationality or, or uh, class uh, positioning or uh, ethnic identities, racial identities, gender identities, sexual identities. Religious ones. You know, so these are part of, you know, we're all born into a particular culture that, that we, you know, you're a baby, you know, it, it just absorbs what its parents think and feel. Maybe they don't say directly, but you acquire this sense of your identities with, with, uh, with, the, with, these, with the culture, with the social position. with the ideals or the attitudes uh, that are that are maybe never made kind of consciously explicit but assumed and this of course really you know you can see it in living in uh, like living in Thailand is a very good mirror for for a lot of like American cultural identities, a lot of assumptions and attitudes that are part of being born into that society uh, because you're in a different kind of culture, very different cultural milieu and, and attitudes. And so you, it, it kind of like mirrors your own sense of being American, which isn't particularly, you know, you can't, it's harder to, more difficult to see when you're living in the States because everybody has pretty much operates from that identity. The same attitudes, assumptions that Americans have. Like even after 34 years living in, in the UK, I realize culturally I'm still very American you know, because, you know, like talking to the other Americans, Ajahn, Gianto, and so forth, we share a cultural identity, assumptions, rather, not, not a particular stated position, but assumptions that come from being born and growing up and acquiring those uh, attitudes uh, from that, being, you know, from that particular, being born into that society. And then you like have, um, of course, in the States you've got all these racial issues like the uh, 
black, the Af Afro-Americans, have different cultural identities. There's certain ones that, that we share as Americans, but, but then, you know, to think that Afro-Americans have the same assumptions that white Americans have, you get it all wrong, you know, because they, they have different social conditioning or attitude based on color of the skin, race. Now in, uh, I'm just pointing, like Sila Bhattabaramasa then is this conventional, you know, clinging to conventional reality, clinging to convention. And so how do we get behind all that? And then the Wichikicha, the third fetter, is doubt. Skeptical doubt, uncertainty. And that is, you know, when you contemplate, you end up being caught, caught in doubt, skepticism, when you attach to thinking. Thinking, attachment to thought, to ideas, will always create this sense of doubt. Skeptical doubt, uncertainty, insecurity through attachment to your thinking process. The thinking process is dualistic. You know, so we, we, we on that level, it's, it's rational, it can be logical, it can be intelligent. Like we go to universities, don't we? Because we... We try to gain information and increase our ability to reason and use logic. And the idea of modern life is to be reasonable about things. So I hear that all the time. Let's be reasonable. And, uh, and uh, you know, reason is something we, we quite admire. To be reasonable. And just pointing out that these are artificial creations. You're not born with reason. You know, you're not born with, uh, with uh, any cultural identity or a sense of your ego or self. Like a newborn baby isn't, isn't born thinking, you know, I'm, a, I'm a little boy or I'm a little girl baby or I'm a, a, an English baby, isn't it? That you get when you're growing up, your parents say, you're, you're a little boy, and you're English, and you're middle-class English, or you're working-class English. So these, you see, you acquire that after your birth. It's not part of the dhammachat, or natural flow of conditioned phenomena, arising, ceasing, it's created by human, by human beings. And language also. Whether you speak English or German, French, Thai, Singhalese or whatever. You know, these are quiet. You know, why do we have different languages? Why can't we all speak just one language? Because they're born different parts of the planet in different cultures, different uh, climates, different religious identities, tribal identities, ethnic identities. <clears throat> so that's why in, in the conditioned phenomena is to discern conditioned phenomena like this. It can be right, wrong, good, bad. It, it can, you know, dualism is, is when you have one, you have the other. If you have hell and heaven, you have hell. If there's good, there's bad. If there's right, there's wrong. And that's the nature of, uh, you know, because things are, you know, on a conventional level, some things are better than others, bigger, smaller, 
uglier, more beautiful, what's right, what isn't right, what's wrong, what's bad, and, and all that. So we, you know, and we're caught in this, what we call this dualistic structure of the, of the conditioned realm with no perspective on it. You know, and then our education is all about clinging to views, opinions, ideas, concepts, how things should be. So this, this, this is a, encourage this identity, you know, seeing this identity, that to discern this, which is aware of what you think you are, of your, you know, of maybe assumptions you have from your cultural conditioning, your education, or, uh, or the just attachment, blind, helpless, ignorant attachment to your ideas, your views, your opinions, thoughts, thinking process. You know, on a personal level, I, I like to be. I like to see myself as a reasonable man. I like to see myself on a personal level as, as a as a man who's being reasonable about life. I don't like to see myself as as an emotionally kind of overwhelming man who's just totally always caught up in in feelings. You know, the ideal for, for my generation of men in the States was to be reasonable, sensible, realistic, practical, good. Now those are all good concepts, aren't they? They're, you know, they're, uh, <clears throat> we all, you know, I think this is what we all aspire to as, as persons. But then in the realities of, of living life, you find yourself being irrational, unreasonable, emotional. And seeming so far out from being reasonable and all the, the good things that you aspire to. Now this is, you know, the the conflict, the inner battles between the intellect, the ideal world and the intellect and the emotional realities we live with. Emotions are like this, they're not reasonable. You can't have reasonable emotions. Sometimes they're totally unreasonable. And, you know, we don't, sometimes we're embarrassed by our emotions and and uh, we don't, you know, don't hope, hope you don't see what I'm actually feeling at this moment. <laughs> you know, so we learn how to, to perform in society, to look reasonable, even when we're in, uh, uh, you know, a basket case. <laughs> Usually have, have a mask you can assume in public. So this is like, like emotions are about feeling, you know, and, and identity with the feeling. Like if I'm, I'm, if I'm a person, you know, and, and I want to be treated properly, I want to be, you know, I don't want to be looked down on. I don't want to, I want to be respected on a personal level. I feel I should be respected and treated properly and, uh, you know, I hope people can, you know, respect me and admire me. I like that. But then when I'm not, when people don't respect me or admire me or they look down on me or they insult me, then the emotions are not being reasonable at all. Feel anger, resentment, hurt, offended. Now, the awareness of that, isn't it? Being aware of, 
of the immersion. Because awareness can include both the, the ideal, the reasonable side, and the, and the emotion all at the same moment. It is inclusive, you know, it's not about getting rid of one and, and holding on to the other. But it, you know, with mindfulness, it's an inclusive, embracing, intuitive sense of knowing. It's like this, emotions are like this, this feeling of being sad or hurt by things is like this. The feeling of not being respected or appreciated is like this. And, and then, the, the, then as I feel, if I come from, you know, I'm not being appreciated, I'm not, I'm not getting the respect, that, the respect that I should get, and then, then I can, you know, then one can get carried away if one grasps that, that emotion, then you know, you can get wound up with it. Blaming people, blaming oneself, blaming the monastic life, blaming the Thai forest tradition, blaming the head monk, blaming the head nun, blaming, blaming. This is a very blaming society, by the way, if you may have noticed. Britain, always blaming. So Gordon Brown's been blamed for all kinds of things, and Alistair Darling blamed, and then David Cameron, he's, he wants to become prime minister so he can be blamed. <laughs> and we all can get off on blaming them. Everything's wrong with this country because of Gordon Brown. So I mean, it's uh, you know this is this is the way the society is. So we blame we blame ourselves, we blame others, blame parents. Bhikkhus blame nuns, nuns blame bhikkhus. What is this blame anyway? And so one can be aware. When I'm blaming somebody, if, I, if, I, if I'm not aware, then I just believe I get caught up into, into a whole kind of boring scenario of blaming or observing it. So this is like this uh, mantra of Bhutto is, uh, reminds me. Sound of silence. Referring to that, I stop, I stop blaming immediately. And that, that just stops that, the, the momentum of, uh, of that emotion. Feeling sorry for myself. Just referring to the sound of silence will stop the momentum of that, that particular emotional pattern. So this, uh, you know, reflection uh, th th during this retreat, you know, to encourage you to really, if you really uh, take an interest in these fetters, the first three fetters, it can be quite interesting, in fact. You know, if you're suffering and uh, feeling of offended or resentments or doubts or fears, you know, this is an opportunity. Don't try to just go into a nice tranquil state to avoid it, but you know, challenge it. Really get to the root of emotional tendencies, attitudes, assumptions. Not to get rid of them, but to understand this is to see, you know, see them from this position of puto, seeing them in terms of Dhamma rather than as my real world, myself, my view my life, which is, is uh, you know, if we, if we never see that in the, as an object, then we operate always from this divisive separateness of the 
un, of the born, the created, the form, the condition. Page 44, Reflection on the Four Exes. You notice last evening we talked at the reflection after using the four requisites. Let's just recently been inserted. Usually we've only done the, the other one. But in Thailand, for example, we always did the morning one and then in the evening, the evening one. So there's a reminding of the, the four requisites. This is a samana, what we call samana sanya. Uh, you know, these four requisites are, are worldly possessions. Uh, in terms of, you know, this tradition, the road, alms, food, uh, shelter, and medicine. Now this is, you know, it's to reflect that this is our, this is, you know, what a sum of life is, these four requisites. Uh, and they're just for practical, that you're not for vanity or for envy, but just for basic survival. 